Chapter 22 If I ever see you in this town again, I will bury you in the desert where no one will find you. Late November 2002 Dennis and Dolly got married on November 29th. Biker weddings are like any other except very few suits, no ties, no expensive dresses, no champagne, no toast to the parents of the bride, no toast to the parents of the groom, no cocktail at the reception, no sit down card at dinner, and most definitely no funky chicken or electric slide group dance. The proper attire was cuts and clean jeans and dirty boots for the men and anything nice for the women which meant anything decent that could be bought for less than $40 at Walmart or Target. The Den Bestin ceremony was held at the Riviera Baptist Church on Marina Avenue. It's a funny thing to see a bunch of avowed, unapologetic sinners file into a church. It's even funnier when you're pretending to be one of them. The pastor, a short rail of a man in a light blue suit with a dark blue tie, had the eyes of a man created to be confided in. He stood by the door of the chapel and took each of our hands in both of his. He spoke in a near whisper, but each word was clear. Welcome to the Rivera Baptist Church for this wonderful occasion. The church wasn't erected on the grand scale of the Southern Baptist churches I'd seen in Georgia. It was spare and unassuming. Like the pastor, it had a border town feel, a Western outlaw vibe. It was the last place a complicated man came to receive the guidance of God before he did whatever it was he had to do. The little church knew that people weren't as good as God wanted them to be, but that it would never stop with the business of trying to salvage the soul. The service was brief and practical. Dennis wore his cut over a cheap suit and Dolly was dressed in a Walmart special, probably the underwear to match. When it came time for Dennis to kiss his bride, he let her have it. We left and milled around the parking lot. There were over a dozen of us, and we discussed where we'd celebrate. Smitty and Dennis suggested the Inferno. A sense of propriety overtook JJ. She said, hell with that, guys. Let's have it over at our place. The guys said it wasn't necessary. JJ insisted. Then I insisted, and they said it was cool. Some of them had other things they needed to do, and Smitty had to go home first, so we split up and agreed to meet at the Bullhead Undercover House on Verano Circle at 9 p.m. I went home to set up, and JJ and Timmy went and got a couple 30 packs of Bud Light and two jumbo buckets of KFC fried chicken and a few combo platters from Taco Bell, the culinary makings of the perfect H.A. wedding reception. The guys showed up. The rapper Nelly blasted on our system as they walked in. I was in the middle of the room with JJ dancing like a white boy at a pep rally. No one knew what to do. For a short while they stood there like wallflowers at a junior high prom. Then between songs, Dennis walked up to the stereo and turned it all the way down. He asked, Burr, what the fuck is that jungle music? That's my shit, Dennis. Well, it ain't mine and this is my wedding day. Put on something else. I said, okay, and fired up the same old Stephen Wolf crap that these guys live for and the party came to life. JJ showed them where the food was and they dug in. Dennis and Dolly looked happy. They ate chicken and drank beer and talked with Jimmy. Timmy and I drank with a couple of guys who had been at the ceremony. An angels nomad named Dale Hormoth and the hang around Billy Schmidt. Schmidt and Lydia showed up with Pops a little while later. Eric Kloss, another angels nomad who'd been at the wedding, was supposed to be with them but wasn't. I'd prepped some roost props for Smitty, some pictures of my old partner Carlos, and a short personal note from Carlos to Smitty. I also had a roost email from a guy named Gato that discussed the King Mongols problem. Smitty barely looked at the stuff from Carlos, read the email twice, and then told me we needed to talk. We went out back. We each lit a cigarette. There's some trouble brewing, and you need to know about it. Lydia got a call from an associate across the river. She said there's 50 Mongols over in Laughlin and they're planning on coming over tomorrow to break us up. It was the first I've heard of that. I immediately thought, call Slats, he continued. I sent Eric over there. Lydia gave him her 38 and he left his cut in my car. Incognito, you know, I hear you. He'll get back to us, good. But we're going to be loaded up tomorrow night at the Nomads rally. Billy's gonna look after the guns, keep all of them in his truck behind the Inferno. Me, I'm bringing two shotguns, a couple pistols, and my Tech 9. Those fuckers come, we'll be ready. Alright, I pause. Good. Smitty raised his eyebrows and said, check this out. He pulled a Taurus pistol from his waistband. This is one of the pistols I'll have tomorrow. Gonna sell Bad Bob one next week. 
He flicked the switch below the barrel and a red beam shot off, piercing the dark. He sighted it on a wall. I asked him if he'd sell me one. He said, sure he would, as soon as the nomads party was over. He said he might have to sell it to me if the Mongols show. As he turned off the laser sight and tucked the pistol into his pants, he said, you gotta understand one thing, Burr. You're there for us tomorrow. Things get thick, and as far as I'm concerned, you fight like you're a hell's angel. You protect your solo brothers, but you buck up for us. I stood tall, didn't smile, and nodded. I said, Smitty, that'll be my fucking honor. All the undercovers had deep conversations that night. I had mine with Smitty. Timmy got more information from Billy about the weapons cache he'd been guarding, and JJ talked self-defense strategies with the women. Lydia wanted to know if JJ regularly packed. JJ said she did. Lydia said that if things turned out sour, their job would be to gather the old ladies, get them behind the bar, and take up position to defend them. She said, you and me, we'll shoot whoever the fuck comes near us. As a law enforcement officer, my first job is to prevent things like this from happening. After the dinner party, the Black Biscuit Task Force notified the Laughlin and the Bullhead Police Departments to be on the lookout. We hoped the Mongols-Angels confrontation wouldn't even come to pass. But if the Mongols did manage to reach the Inferno and things turned bad, then my second job would kick in, protecting myself and my fellow operatives. This wouldn't be all bad. If the Mongols showed and I was forced to protect the Solos and the Angels and live to tell the tale, then my credibility would be furthered. JJ was understandably nervous. She didn't carry openly like the rest of us, like Lydia. Her pistol was in her purse. We spent the morning at the patch, and when we got back to the Verano Circle House, we were greeted by a snoring Eric Klaus, who crashed out on our couch. We went about our business like he was part of the family. When he finally woke up, he grabbed a beer and walked into the garage. The door was open and the afternoon light streamed in. He took a long swig of beer and scratched his butt. JJ and I sat on my bike. I had a cigarette in my mouth. I smoked it without the use of my hands, which I kept on my handlebars. JJ practiced drawing my glocks from behind me. She reached around my torso and crossed her arms. She unsnapped the holsters with her thumbs, then drew the gun on the left with her right hand and vice versa. She uncrossed her arms quickly and came out blazing, a black pistol on both sides at shoulder height, ready to fire. She holstered them and did it again and again and again and again. Eric watched and drank his beer. After a while he asked, you guys are fucking serious, huh? The guns were holstered. JJ formed her right hand into a pistol, pointed at it. Oh! JJ formed her right hand into a pistol, pointed it at Eric, smiled her generous smile and said, yup, I just nodded. We'd be fashionably late. Timmy called to check in around two. He said, the guys are on edge, but ready. There's a lot of boozing, but not much drugging, except for Vicodin. They're popping them like Pez candies. I said, figures. Yeah, they're anxious. There's a lot of shop talk too. Doug and Hank has some shit they want to sell today. Some other guy wants to sell us a full auto. Billy told Pops he wants to sell him a couple shotguns ASAP. I said, Jesus, we're like guns are us. Tommy laughed and said, yup. I told him I'd sign some cash out of our safe before we headed over. He said, good, we'll probably need it. We hung up. I called Slats and let him know the situation. He told me there'd been no reports of Mongo activity in Laughlin. JJ and I got to the bar about five. The mood was strange. The guys were serious but mellow, zonked by massive quantities of alcohol and painkillers. JJ broke off to talk to the girls. I went to talk to Timmy, Smitty, and Joby. We said hello and gave each other hugs. Joby, a non-drinker, was not dulled by booze. Smitty was distant but serious looking. This was his party in his town, and he didn't want anything to break bad. But if it did, he'd be ready. Joby sprouted the usual invective against the Mongol enemies. For the time being, they remained imaginary, as did the violence he would unleash upon them. Smitty leaned close and said, so far, so good. That's good news, I said. Joby closed his eyes and shook his head forcefully. Fuck that. I want those fuckers to show up. Then he nodded to someone over my shoulder and excused himself. Once he was out of earshot, Smitty asked, You remember those silencers you showed me? Sure do. You changed your mind about selling them? They're already sold, Smit. Sorry, I lied. Well, you getting more? No, not at the moment. What's up? 
Can you put me in touch with your guy? I'd love to get one of those for my Ruger. I told Smitty I'd look into it. He said, good. JJ did a few deals, got some Vicodin, and bought a little baggie of meth from Dolly. JJ told me later that Lydia kept telling her how impressed everyone was with me and the solos, and how happy she was, personally, that I had such a solid girlfriend in JJ. JJ told me she blushed when Lydia told her that, that she was actually flattered. Lydia's words gave JJ confidence, and like a good undercover, JJ flipped that confidence back onto Lydia in the form of credibility. JJ was getting accepted far more quickly than I ever could have imagined. JJ became our drug clearing house. They were all small quantities, but she needed to make an evidence drop. It looked unlikely, but we had to assume we'd still have an altercation with the Mongols, which meant we'd be dealing with law enforcement first responders who wouldn't know about our undercover status. We didn't want to be carrying anything if we got arrested. I told Doug and Hank to meet us at my place around 9 if they wanted to do their gun deal. This is the pretense we used to dip out for a little while. We went to a Circle K. I stood at the counter and bought a pack of cigarettes while JJ walked down an aisle decorated with shiny bags of snacks. The task force agent Buddha was fingering a bag of Fritos when JJ brushed up against him, pushing a bag of evidence into his back pocket. We paid and left. Then we drove to the Ronald Circle house, met with Doug and Hank and did the deal. They were a little unsure of dealing with JJ in the room, but I said if they couldn't deal with her, they couldn't deal with me. Since they were on the cash end of the decent transaction for three semi-automatic pistols, they couldn't disagree. They asked for $1,600. I had JJ inspect the weapons, which she did, and nodded with the slightest hint of wariness, and I said, $1,500, no more. They said that was good too. I said, good news, thanks for keeping the store open. They asked if they could crash at our place that night. I said, by all means, absolutely. I let them know Eric Kloss would be sleeping over again too. They were cool with that. We all went back to the Inferno and the Mercury. The night dragged on. Some guys started to do meth. Others passed out. At one point, I asked Smitty why they were letting their guard down. He said, with equal parts of relief and regret, those faggots ain't coming. We left past midnight. JJ was packed double with me. Doug, Hank, and Eric rode solo. Timmy and Pops drove the Merc. I told them that if we didn't show up at home that night to come looking for us, we were either out partying or had been arrested. It was a joke. We all laughed. On the way home, on a dark side street deliberately taken to avoid a confrontation, we were pulled over for a traffic stop. The angels were used to these, and JJ and I pretended to be. They knew what to expect from a cop. In a way, it's a point of honor and pride to be continually jacked by the police, even though, to a man, they bitch about it incessantly. But something strange happened that night, something none of them had ever seen before. Typically, when a mixed club group of bikers is stopped and Hell's Angels are among those present, they get the most thorough attention. Everyone knows the angels are the ones to be wary of, and that given an inch, they will take a mile. They must be attended to first, but they weren't. The cops yelled at the cherry lights. The cops yelled and the cherry lights flashed. An officer approached JJ and me from behind. When he got about 10 feet from us, he racked the shell into the chamber of his shotgun. JJ's legs pinched me hard. We didn't move. I didn't appreciate the sound of that shotgun. Maybe they'd been waiting all night for the Mongols, just as we'd been. And since they hadn't come, they took this opportunity to vent some steam. Over the bullhorn, a young, angry voice said, Burr, do not let go of your handlebars until ordered to do so. Do you understand? I nodded yes. I held the bars with a death grip. JJ was on me like a backpack. The angels were told to remain on their bikes. I was ordered off the bike by a young, stout officer. JJ and I were separated. They led me behind their vehicles. Hands on your head. Lock those fingers. Cross your ankles. Sit. The cuffs went on one wrist at a time. The young cop said, you gotta take your jacket off. I jangled my cuffs. How am I supposed to do that? He breathed, shit. Be Besides, I wouldn't take it off for you even if I could. I knew this was stupid, but I also knew it would play well with the angels who were being lined up a few feet away. The young cop grabbed my arm and hauled me up. Shut up, we're gonna take your picture. Good, I ain't saying cheese. He tightened my cuffs, they hurt. He took my guns and handed them off. Another cop, started snapping the camera as I got turned around, front, side, back. 
I was wearing my goatee and two long braids that night and the cop with the camera said, you look like a fucking catfish. As they did this, they positioned JJ so I could see them frisking her. She wasn't wearing a bra and they weren't shy about where they put their hands. They frisked her again. She took it in stride. I was very angry, but there was nothing I could do. When they were done taking pictures, I was led to the curb and told to kneel. I was led to the barrel of a loaded and charged shotgun. Don't move. We gotta talk to your little girlfriend. We gotta talk to your buddies. JJ was taken to a marked unit and ducked into the back seat. The guys were cuffed and lined up curbside. No one but me had to kneel. No one but me had a gun drawn on them. The angels couldn't believe it. But as far as these cops were concerned, I was more dangerous than they were. A cop came up to JJ and asked her through the roll down window of the cruiser what she was doing hanging out with a guy like me. She didn't look at him. She asked, what? Opposed to a guy like you? That was the end of that conversation. She listened to the rap sheets over the radio. She was clean. I had a few minor and fabricated priors. Claus had some minor stuff too, and Watkins had an outstanding warrant for a traffic violation. That wouldn't wash well with the fact that they caught him carrying a concealed Bowie knife. He was placed in a marked unit and bound to spend the night in jail. It was damn sheep that scared JJ. There was a bunch of drug stuff, including a felony conviction for cocaine trafficking. But the kicker was that he'd been arrested for severely assaulting the police officer. JJ prayed that he wouldn't get motivated to go at it again. Meanwhile, Officer Shotgun talked to me. He wanted to know where I lived. Why was I still in Bullhead? Hadn't I heard they'd been looking into me? He said, you gotta move on, bruh. You gotta get the fuck out of my town. I said, you can arrest me or lecture me, but I won't take both, so make up your mind. If you're gonna cut me loose, I'm all ears. But if you're shit canning me, shut up and take me downtown, cause I ain't interested. He didn't like that. He put his boot in between my shoulder blades and pushed me to the ground. Since I was cuffed, I caught the pavement with my cheek. He kneeled, leaned in close, and whispered into my ear, Motherfucker, if I ever see you in this town again, I will fucking bury you in the desert where no one will ever fucking find you. My recorder was going. I thought, not good, dude. Not good for you. <laughs> I knew this guy desperately wanted me out of his town, and I knew he wasn't using approved methods. I wanted to tell him what I was, but I couldn't. It would be months until he learned how close he'd come to ruining his career that night. They took Hank, but they had nothing on. They took Hank, but they had nothing on us. They cut us loose. As they wound down their show, puffing out their chest, taking their cuffs off, giving us our guns back, telling us to go home and mind our business, a dark, late model Mercury Cougar crept by. I saw Pops rubbernecking at us in the passenger window, smiling. JJ saw him climb behind me on my bike and said quietly, "What a joke."